In the interest of time, at the 10 minute mark, if your speakers, I'll be sitting there and I'll hold my hand up, and at 12 minutes, I will go over to the side of the room and awkwardly stand there, and then at 14 minutes, you'll be completely cut off. So, um, just a warning, and we have a really great session today. We're starting with Sean Anderson, who will be talking about ecological and social impacts of the May 2015 Refugio oil spill. Thanks. I will attempt to I will attempt to talk to you today. Um, it was it was obviously long last night, and uh, so um, yes. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the Refugio oil spill today. I'll put my drink down so I don't fry this computer. Um, so I want to say before we get going, this is the work of a bunch of folks, tons and tons of some of you in the audience, lots of students, collaborators, all over the place. Part of a um, now four-year effort to create an um, originally to create an index of beach health. And uh, one of the knock-on effects is we've been able to do to respond to things and, and get some understanding from things like the Refugio oil spill. So since I'll probably bore everyone and uh, might not be able to talk by the end, uh, the couple takeaways I want to leave you with is that uh, we believe because in Southern California, our Southern California counties are 60 to over 90 percent sandy beach in terms of coastline, we think that the sandy beach was the, the absolute epicenter for impacts for this um, particular oiling event. Um, had impacts on, on the critters that hang out in the sand, maybe had some impacts to the charismatic megafauna, not very clear. Um, but then also, uh, one thing we'll talk about today is that there was, there was various social impacts, eco economic, et cetera, that, um, were, that happened but were generally fleeting. And we'll talk about that. Uh, next theme that will emerge is, uh, or hopefully will, if I'm coherent, um, is the story of the incident command. We first saw this, I first saw this intimately with the Deepwater Horizon Incident Command. This is the federal structure that responds to these spills. Um, massively dysfunctional, I would argue. And especially in the context of what we're talking about today, human dimensions and communicating to the public and informing the public as to what's going on in their resource. Um, and then again, there's, this, there's uh, at least with this spill, there's this divergence of ecological impact and the perception of what the impacts are. So we'll, we'll talk about that for a slide or two. So let's talk about the Refugio spill. So this is um, uh, north of the main uh, settled area of Santa Barbara. This is on the Refugio Coast. And basically, this is last May. <clears throat> this is the Plains All-American Pipeline, which is important to say was um, uh, put in as a, uh, as a best practice. The pipeline went in so we wouldn't be tankering oil up and down the coast. So the impacts are comparatively mild. Um, this build, you, you all heard maybe 100,000 gallons, that was wrong, it's been revised upward a couple times, but this is the most recent one, about 50% increase, so about 140 odd thousand gallons spilled. On the right, so this image here, we're looking down on, <clears throat> on the 101 on PCH, and it happened to the right. The vast majority of the oil did not get into the ocean, only about 20, 21,000 gallons actually filled up a pool, you can see it on the right, and then right here, spilled down the, the coast, and then oiled the beach, and then went into the, uh, to the ocean. Um, so there's a lot of talk at the time about, is this another Santa Barbara oil spill? No, it wasn't. Um, but a lot of the rhetoric you saw evolving around it, a lot of the media hype, absolutely followed the same pattern, um, including politicians coming down and saying they would change things, blah, 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 blah. Um, uh, yeah, we don't have to talk about that. So we started going out um, the next morning to survey some of our sites. Uh, this was great. Again, this is a, a uh, an example of how dedicated our students are. They were all on, they left for a two-week vacation. They were on their two-week vacation right before we would normally start on June 1. They all came back and we started sampling and it, was, and it was great. So it's their dedication that really allowed us to do a lot of, of the stuff we did. Um, what we hear is that the warm fuzzies are always in the headlines. The picture on the left made a huge number of rounds on Twitter and Instagram and this and that. And uh, uh, we encountered a lot of marine mammals in our surveys this past summer, none of which had clear signs of oil um, impact. And the samples we've sent, none of them have, have come back, um, as far as they've shared with us, um, that they've been oiled. So uh, that was going on. <coughs> The, so this is our human dimensions impacts. I'm not going to talk too much about the biological side of things, but it's important to say that um, there were ecological impacts from this oil spill, especially in the sandy beach. Um, so what we're looking at here is a tar strand line and um, dead emerita, dead sand crabs. 
uh, you will see uh, castings, you will see exoskeletons, especially the young guys. We never saw before lots of adults that were just sitting on the beach. Normally the birds would scavenge those. So this was um, clear evidence that um, these guys were dying. Not only were these guys uh, messed up, but we had things like dead grunion and, and uh, grunion eggs impacted, etc. Um, overall, last year, this was, this was um, a correlate, or this happened at the same time as we saw a general decline in a lot of our infawn in the sandy beaches, presumably due to oceanic conditions. So we had low power to detect a change. So what we did is we, in addition to our surveys, we went in and we did um, various lab experiments where we um, uh, exposed various critters, juveniles, et cetera, uh, to oil at, at environmentally relevant concentrations. And without showing you graphs, this is the kind of stuff you saw. So on the right would be clean seawater. These are little eggs from uh, Emerita, natural history. Rafe would be proud of us that we're talking about this, looking at stuff. And on the left would be um, uh, poorly developing and, and or individuals that would be dead uh, in a few days that were exposed to uh, different sources of tar from that we collected from the beach at different concentrations. Okay, so the thing we're going to talk about today is the... Um, the human dimension side of things. So our university is really built around interdisciplinarity, and we really truly mean that. So a lot of our research um, takes place in interdisciplinary context. So for example, we've been doing uh, public opinion polling for the last decade in the coast, and we pair that with our ecological surveys, and we think that it gives us some um, perhaps additional insights and additional power to see what's going on. For example, um, this is uh, some, so we do these surveys every fall, and this particular question started being asked in 2010, which was, is, is seafood from the Gulf of Mexico safe to eat? Obviously, this was a Deepwater Horizon, um, previous big oil spill. And so this is data for, the data I'm showing you here is just from Los Angeles, Ventura, and Santa Barbara counties. So this is just our, our local California uh, take on things. And this is uh, the proportion of people that think seafood is safe, uh, seafood from the Gulf, excuse me, is safe to eat. And so what you see is, there's this long, there's this pretty long window. Only in 2015 is there a significant effect, and it's just barely, um, of a change. This event strongly characterized people's opinion of this resource, and it persisted for several years. Um, that did not happen with this refugio oil spill. Did not persist for years. So let me walk you through this real quick. So this is the same question. In this case, this is just from 2012 onward. But this is asking about is seafood from California, do you believe seafood from California is safe to eat? And so we have this background level, uh, safer than the Gulf, thank God, whoa, okay, we're, that's clean. Um, so, so we have this background level hovering around 50% of people say, yes, it's definitely safe to, to eat. Others will say it's unsure and, and other things, but, but that's our background level. Right after the Santa, right after the Refugio spill, we were on the beach and we started doing um, our surveys, <clears throat> these, these, these uh, opinion instruments, and what you see is there's a dramatic decline in people's confidence in seafood. But whereas in other spills, this persisted for a long period of time, this data here on the, so this was, this is May, this far, this is uh, September and early October. Um, it's basically, it's technically still statistically significantly different, but give us a month or two and I, I don't think it will be. So this pattern started emerging with this oil spill that, um, uh, whatever happened was fleeting, and it didn't persist. We think that's partly due to the fact that this, the tarring event was very unusual. We really had this, everything was clean, and then all of a sudden we started getting this random dollop, dollop, dollop down in Los Angeles County, dollop in Ventura, dollop here, dollop there. And it led to a lot of, um, especially in the public, distrust. They weren't sure what was going on. And I, I guess I can't forward anymore. I've broken my slides. That's great. Oh, phew, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> so, the incident command was releasing what are called SCAT surveys, where they go and they check how much oil is on the beach, but this was totally inadequate. It was, we get a, an update maybe three weeks after they did their surveys, and we have a lot of reason to think maybe this wasn't done as completely as they're supposed. They're supposed to go two feet into the sand. They clearly didn't do that. Um, but so, so there was no, um, the public weren't getting their, their information. We couldn't get our information. So we went and we characterized all of our beaches in terms of tar. This is a little map of just the area up most proximate to the spill, but we had our own independent measures, and we created a scoring index in terms of how much tar was uh, happening, how much tarring was happening. Most of our history with, tar, with oil spills are based on these kind of things. This is the largest oil spill in U.S. history that just drove past us on my way up here. This is in Kern County. It's 100 years ago. This is twice the size of the Deepwater Horizon that you guys probably don't know anything about. 
Um, and uh, the impact, huge, right there. As we went away, it got less and less. Same with Deepwater Horizon, same with Exxon Valdez. We normally have these huge spills, so we have a very clear signature of the epicenter, and then it decays out. So there's a lot of COVID, um, confounding issues with that. In this spill, because it was much more dollopy, it actually set up a nice um, experiment, observational experiment we could do. So for example, this is 90 kilometers south of the oil spill, inches thick of tar were accumulating. You go a quarter mile down the beach, and clean. You go another quarter mile down the beach and, and intermediate, intermediate amounts of tar. So we decided to ask, does this tarring, for example, affect um, people's perceptions or, or affect um, people's takeaway from this? So in this, in this one, just to show you there's, there's no effect, this is driving. So this is in, people encountered on, the, on 33 different beaches up and down the coast. Uh, how far did you drive today to get to the beach? And there's no significant, and so then zero is no tar. And then up to the right is, is more and more um, categories of tar. And, but when you look at spending, spending is, is strongly affected by um, where they are. And because of, this, because of this patchy nature, it's not all um, just in Santa Barbara, for example. The oil is down in Ventura, et cetera. So we see this. However, and here's my crappy graph. Um, so uh, however, by, again, so this blue is going to be um, right after the oil spill. This green is, again, uh, September, early October. There's no effect. People have gone back to spending. Um, there's no significant difference now in terms of oiling. So that effect was also fleeting, and um, I'm almost out of time. So this is, these are a couple WSNers who aren't here right now, but we were having uh, lunch with some other people in this room a couple days later and, um, in this one uh, restaurant in Ventura, and this guy walked up and said that I was loud, which was, like, weird. Um, <laughs> But he said, hey, can you guys basically shut the hell up? Because this is important to me. Stop talking about this oil spill. And then he stammered and then he walked away. It was very clear that ev people had incredibly different perceptions of this oil spill because of the patchy nature of it. It led to them not trusting the media that they were getting. Because the surfer guys would say, would say, oh my god, it's not very oily. And they would go down the beach and their particular site would be oil. And they're like, this is a conspiracy, man. And then the other guys would be doing something else, and they'd say, oil, 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 and they'd go, and it's a clean beach, and they'd like, man, and Byro's, you know, crazy. And so in that, in that realm, the incident command, the official representative of your government that should be giving you clear information, um, they weren't really doing that, and I'm out of time. So again, I'll just mention it's highly variable. So one of the responses to this is to actually talk to the media, even though a lot of us are, don't like to do that to communicate clearly. So we took two approaches. We, we talked to the media because they kept calling us um, a lot. Um, but then we also created a website so that people could get information. Because originally this was created for the reporters, but um, it turns out it's been really useful for a lot of, of the general public and other folks as well. So um, with that, I'm out of, just about out of time. I'll say that again, that, so the takeaways are that uh, sandy dwellers are new, warm fuzzies, whatever, socio-impacts uh, in this particular case, are seem to be different from other oil spills in that they're, they blooped and they've decayed back to their, to their normal stuff. And I think I will stop there. Thanks, you guys.